As we draw closer to Dawn Trail, the latest expansion for the award-winning MMO Final Fantasy XIV, yes, I have to mention it's award-winning, it's somewhere in the player handbook, or the terms and conditions. In any case, as we draw closer to the launch of the expansion, I can't help but look back and think about the MSQ that was, the stories that were told, and the moments that truly connected with me. And with the new content promising more moments of levity and others that will have us weeping freely, I'm left thinking what were the moments that struck me the most in this long journey from A Realm Reborn to Endwalker. Before I begin, there are some moments that everyone knows about, that everyone talks about, and at least in one instance, a moment that the developers themselves won't let us ever forget or move on from. So I'm not going to dwell on those moments. No Horshafan, no Emmet Selk, and or Ardbert, so no end of Shadowbringers. Anything else is fair game. I love stories. It's why I continued to run myriad tabletop RPGs. In fact, I had so many I moved them all to their own channel, Lawful Good Media. Check it out when you have a chance. Speaking of channels, consider liking this video, helping me by sharing it, and hey, that subscription button is free. Just saying. But it's not just story and plot that attract me, but characters, and specifically character moments. Those that deeply affect their individual stories or their development. But with all that said, it's time to begin. Do mind that this is not an ordered list, just a collection of moments that resonated with me and made the experience of Final Fantasy XIV an unforgettable one. Sometimes for emotional reasons and others simply because I gained a deeper appreciation of the wonderful universe and the people living in it. This one happens more or less midway through Shadowbringers, and it's the sequence through which the reincarnation of Menphilia communes with the spirit of the original, the antecedent of the Silence of the Seventh Dawn, known as the Oracle of Light for the people of the First. This section also includes a phenomenal duty controlling Thancred as he fights and holds off Ranjit so the Warrior of Light can escort Menphilia to her destination. What I love about this sequence is how profoundly it impacts all those involved. We get a final farewell to Menphilia, who we'd not seen since the end of Heaven's War two expansions prior, and even that was a short meeting after she vanished at the end of A Realm Reborn. For Rin, it's stepping out of a shadow that's been present throughout her life, and it's her making a choice to be her own person, not just Menphilia number 257, but someone new. To break this cycle of rebirth the Oracle had so far been subjected to, allowing Minfilia to rest. But out of all the different characters involved in this, it's really Thancred's experience that is so touching for me. At the same time, he has to come to terms with the loss of the Minfilia he knew and loved. And what that love was, romantic or not, is up for debate. But love her he did. He has to accept that he has to let go. And at the same time, acknowledge that he now has a kid that needs him and he's not doing either of them any favors by being distant to her. Like it or not, he's her dad and he needs to step up, so he begins to open up and even suggest her new name, Rin. It also helps that for a good 30 seconds I was damn certain that Thancred was getting penciled in for a meeting with the Grim Reaper. And Walker ends with a bang. The end singer is a powerful entity, and the road to get to Meteon is littered with the bodies of our friends, their sacrifices, and even the return of some fan favorites. Everybody shed a tear doing that walk to the sound of closing the distance. But my favorite moment comes right after the battle with the end singer, and it's that final meeting with Meteon. That last conversation before we have to deal with our eternal frenemy. We saw how Meteon turned nihilistic. We fought tooth and nail to make at least one of them turn away from that path even beg us to help silence the Song of Oblivion. And here, in the end, we find another Meteon. Is it the same we found in Elpis? Is it an amalgamation of all of them, much like the End Singer? I don't know. What I do know is we find her sad, broken even, full of regret for not having been able to find the answer Hermes sought, the reason he sent them on their journey, and how everywhere they only found sadness and pain. Then she turns to us and in a truly heartbreaking moment goes back to our original meeting. Greetings. Can you hear me? I wish to hear your words, know your feelings, share your thoughts. And of course, may we be friends? And I realized this is likely the question they asked everyone they met. And this time, this final encounter, we provide something different to her. The answer, that life is a journey made of memories and experiences, ups and downs, and bonds, so many bonds, that make it a worthwhile adventure, and ultimately that everyone's answer will differ, be unique to them. 
And though I may be wrong, something that struck me was the tragedy that Hermes sent them out such a long time ago, when the answer was right there at home. But he was in such a bad place, emotionally, existentially, that he couldn't see it, so a part of him rested all his hopes on distant stars. Not many 14 players love A Realm Reborn. In fact, the common thing people tell newcomers is the game gets good in Heavensward after A Realm Reborn. And yet, I enjoyed ARR so much. Is it perfect? Hell no. Gotta use some revisioning, of course. Particularly in the way it conveys the point that the primal summonings are a constant threat, and that defeating the primals themselves is merely a stopgap, not a real solution. But the ending, that final sequence leading up to the dinner at the Sultana's palace and the assassination, it is powerful. And not just because of Raban and Ilbert, or even their fates or that of Telegi Adelegi, the whole package. A Realm Reborn had, until then, made the science your safety net, and this event scattered them to the winds. Not only that, but this sequence permanently and drastically changed the fates of Benfilia, Ishtola, and Thancred. Benfilia disappears, her fate unknown until the very end of Heaven's War. Thancred is left temporarily blind in one eye, but unable to use ether ever again. And Ishtola becomes trapped in the life stream, and when rescued, seems to be completely blind and has to resort to some form of ether sight, seeing the world through the flow of ether, something that Matoya tells her is a quick way to get dead, as in doing that will shorten her lifespan. There are many discussions on whether one or more of the science should be killed off, and I think most forget. Ishtola already has the classic Final Fantasy Deep of Doom, that little clock on top of her head. Her time may come up sooner rather than later. And if that wasn't enough, with the reveal of the corruption of the Crystal Braves, everyone is suddenly a fugitive, with enemies where once they had allies. And it marks the fall of Alfinol. This is the sequence of events that crushed his spirit but set him on the path to becoming the person he was meant to be, to come to terms with his mistakes and make up for them, still keeping his ideals, but now tempered by experience. In other words, we don't get that wonderful character development without the end of a realm reborn. And one last thing, if you've never heard Yu Yu Hase's voice in Japanese, do yourself a favor to listen to it. It's unforgettable. This scene comes between Shadowbringers and Endwalker, and it's that scene where we first meet Fortunal Evelier, Alfino and Alize's father, and one of the members of the Forum, the ruling body of Charlian. At that point in time, we knew of Charlian, but beyond the members of the Science of the Seventh Dawn and Matoya, we hadn't interacted with anyone from that place. And we knew they valued neutrality, which of course made it so none of the characters we knew represented the average Charlian, least of all the hardcore variety. Enter Papa Fortunal. Statuesque, rigid, impassive, a detached scholar, his voice steady at all times. He comes to give the Charlene people's answer to the request of help against the Telophoroi, the Endbringers. And yes, that's the translation of that Greek term. We know the other members of the family. We know Alfino, Alize, and Louis Sua, so we're kind of expecting this guy to say, sure, we'll help, point us in the direction you want us to start kicking in. And the reality is the complete opposite. And we get to see firsthand how far the Charlene people and their leaders will go to preserve their neutrality. Completely disregard the warning of some dangerous people coming to end the world. Where still, the moment his children challenge this position, quoting their grandfather on how ignoring the fate of those you could save is not wisdom but indolence, Orshanot disowns them, cutting all ties with them. You are no longer my children, go away. Of course, during Endwalker, we'll learn more about Fortunal and his motivations, but this scene is such a good bit of foreshadowing for most, if not all, of the Charlayan arc of Endwalker. This is a small-scale representation, or the kind of thing the Scions and the Warrior of Light will face when trying to secure the aid of the Forum and the people of Charlayan. Stone-faced rebuttals. This entire scene is a preview, and it's genius. Garlemald has been a thorn in the side of the people of Eorzea since 1.0, and they're a constant threat. Their magitek are dangerous, and they keep their lands under control with an iron fist, and a dedication and loyalty that borders on zealotry. But when we reach Garlemald, we find a husk 
of a once proud nation and despite the best intentions, the people of this land cannot accept their former enemies are now lending them a hand. Garlemald's arc is full of tragic moments, often because of this wall that exists between Garleans and everyone else. They are desperate, hungry, and cold in a land that in the blink of an eye turned against them, and through a combination of pride and ignorance, and perhaps a generational, deeply set sense of persecution, Garleans are extremely xenophobic. To the point, they'd rather take their chances in the wilds with monsters than having to deal with any of us. So Garlemald's arc is pretty dark, and it shows this proud people now holding on to the barest of threats. And then we meet Quintus, the last of the Garlean Legion commanders, the last one staging on Garlean soil. He is yet another one who refuses to accept that former enemies are now here to offer aid, that the Telophoroi are a common enemy. And so he treats this as an invasion by foreign powers, even going so far as to send troops to attack the base camp of this welfare effort. And in doing so, we arrive at the darkest and perhaps most heartbreaking moment, when the Eorzean Alliance passes on a message from the leaders of another legion, who we discover had sought out the Eorzeans for help, having had their forces decimated as they attempted to retake Garlemald. The message is simple, have the ill stand down. Simply put, stop fighting, accept the help. There is no more hope of reclaiming past glory and pride. Garlemald, as we know it, is done. And Quintus honors this command and orders his men to stand down. And while everyone thinks this will open the path to peace and getting the Garleans the help they need, with Quintus there to help, Quintus very much dismisses everyone, dissolving military ranks, letting everyone do as they please, and then ending his own life incapable of living in this new reality. And it's truly tragic because Garlemald needed this man. They could have used his strength, his discipline, and his commitment to keep the nation alive. The only problem is, by the time he pulled the trigger, his spirit was broken beyond recovery. After that little bummer, we'll go on a high note. A Realm Reborn showed that primals and their summoning and tempering are a constant threat to the land. Something of a plague, and every time a primal is removed, it's only a matter of time before they come back, before some form of misunderstanding or even injustice leads the beast men of the different tribes to once again look to the heavens, to their prayers and their crystals, and summon their deity, their primal, becoming its slaves in the process, flooded with the primal's ether and shifting their ideals to match that of the so-called god. Then in Shadowbringers, we see Alize working towards helping the recovery of the victims of the Sin Eaters to become whole again, and along the way deducing that the issue is the victims are suffused with light element ether, not unlike tempering. And so we see for the first time a change in the landscape of Eorzea, not just because tempering becomes reversible, but because the nations of the Eorzean Alliance reach out and attempt to build or repair the bridges that connect them to the beastmen tribes, making amends where necessary. By the end, we have no more primals, no more tempered, and most importantly, we see the first steps to peace on Eorzea, of all the people of Eorzea, who for the first time regard each other as equals, as friends even. And Alize's efforts to cure Gabu, her attachment to the little guy, and the little kobold helping, in turn, with his people, are all delightful heartwarming. Oh, Xenos, our dear misguided sociopathic friend. You only wanted a good fight, and fortunately for you, you got it. But as fun as it was to beat the ever-loving snot out of him at the end of Endwalker, to admit that, as an adventurer, there is a part of me and the Warrior of Light that likes the big fights, the jumps into the unknown, my favorite Xenos moment is in the attack of Ralgar's Reach, in Stormblood, the moment that cements Xenos as not only a challenge, but a wall that we have to overcome, and puts him firmly in place as the main villain of the expansion. The man strides in, squares off with Lys, and she can't do a single thing to him, so he takes her out, and Ishtola as well, and then we pounce on him with Pippin and Alize, a three-on-one fight, and we still can't reach him. He very much smacks the crap out of the Warrior of Light and then strides away. 
disappointed in our performance. And then we try again with Yugiri by our side and only manage to snap a horn on his helmet. But that's enough of the man to go, yeah, you're my kind of warrior, I'm gonna let you get stronger. Come at me when you measure up. And thus his obsession with the Warrior of Light begins. But Ralgar's reach was not the creative team telling you that Xenos is powerful. No, 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 no. They showed you why everybody is afraid of this guy. And I love it so much. Another Stormblood moment, and this one is short, but I love it because it speaks to the character, the indomitable will that the Warrior of Light possesses, which is by far the character's greatest strength beyond any blessing by any deity or dragon or anyone. This moment happens in Fordola's cell when she loses control of her echo and taps into the history and life and thoughts and emotions of the Warrior of Light and sees all the hardship, the danger, the violence, the pain, the loss we've been through across the expansions up to that point and she's partly dumbfounded perhaps even horrified and can only think to ask how do you manage to go on despite all of that from her point of view our experiences are too much for anyone to handle and we get a choice for the answer tell her simply we chose to do this or it's for the people we love and those we can yet save but my favorite is simply you know why you saw I love that answer because it can mean so many things, from you know what was at stake if I didn't, you know how much they matter to me, you know what the alternatives were. So many things are conveyed in those short words, and it's brilliant. This is a very short one, but it's the first time I felt like a badass with my Warrior of Light, and it's right before the steps of faith to fight Nidhogg where the Warrior of Light confidently strides towards the dragon, while everyone is running away. It's such a great moment. So, so good. It's basically the creative team hyping you up before you go fight the big bad dragon. I mentioned the end of A Realm Reborn as a very impactful moment for its drama and its consequences, but I cannot deny that the revelation of what really happened that night is truly phenomenal, and it's all because of the mastermind, Lolorito, who took someone else's assassination plot and manipulated events to get rid of his major competitors, Teleji and Raban, while at the same time preserving the Sultana's life. After all, her death is bad for business. Not only that, but everyone involved finally realizes there wasn't a betrayal by the Crystal Braves. No, they were in Lolorito's pocket from the beginning. After all, it's not a betrayal if they were never your allies. And the person who informs everybody of these truths is Lolorito himself, with a smug look on his face and dropping that wonderful line that if the game's starting, you gotta make sure to have a piece on the board, while being part indifferent, part amused by everyone else's outrage at his actions. Lolorito is always in control of the situation, and you gotta love how delightfully devious he can be. Of course, there are many more moments I could delve into. There's Froth and Foam, the tragic fall of Yotsuyu, Little Sun, Burgers with the Scions, and many more. But as much as I've laughed or felt with those moments, they don't match the impact these 10 have had on me. Now I'm looking forward to the moments that Dawn Trail will add to the list. Well, that's enough out of me for this video. See you on the next one.